High risk, high return portfolio is now up 310% year to date, outperforming the S&P 500 10 times. We're on the verge of a stock buyback market melt up dead ahead that's going to significantly benefit our portfolio. There's trillions in new stimulus that's about to be passed. And with the losses to the Democratic Party in Virginia and New Jersey, it has lit a fire under their ass. While we were originally worried they may not come together and pass this bill, now they are pushing this stuff through fast as possible. Biden and Kamala's polls are at record lows. They're in a total panic. And that makes our job laughably easy. This is their last chance to pass spending before the midterms. So I thought Goldman Sachs says they're already talking about another spending package. In general, this is going to drive inflation outrageously out of control. And that's how our clients are positioned and why we're doing so well this year. This is a red alert, buy, 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 trade alert. Now, I have a few warning signs that could say, hey, maybe I'm off. Maybe we we're completely off. And here's what we're going to be examining to determine that. First of all, uh, Tesla going below 800 would get me concerned. Currently, it's above 1,000. So there's nothing to freak out about there. OK, the big oil company dumping would be a warning sign, XOM, Exxon Mobil. It's currently at 63.33. It went below 64, which was a, a good resistance level, but we know why. If we can explain why there's essentially government intervention suppressing some of our assets, then we don't have to get so worried because it's like putting a ball underwater. What's going to happen? The ball's going to spike up. We're going to make a ton of money. DXY going over 94.50 was a line in the sand to be concerned, but we can understand why. Turkey is going through hyperinflation and European banks are desperate for our debt products. So it's actually not a problem. TLT is probably the single greatest problem to worry about. Interest rates rising uh, down 0.9%. It's at 145. Nowhere near our level of 140 where it started to disrupt growth assets uh, in March. Brent oil going below 75 would probably be the biggest red herring, but it's again uh, going up parabolically, three and a half percent today on the news that Biden's going to release our strategic oil reserve. What a joke. And then all this hype about China collapsing. Well, if that's going to be a problem, either their stock market's going to crash, EEM goes below uh, 48, not there, it's at 50, or their currency is going to devalue. Something's got to snap. And right now that's at 6.3. The Chinese currency keeps getting stronger and stronger. So really our only significant warning sign is the dollar rising. DXY is above our critical zone, but it's due to the Turkish lira experiencing hyperinflation. So nothing uh, systemic to worry about. Oil did sell off because US and China announced they're gonna release their reserves. Really a stupid short-sighted move. And the market is understanding that. Uh, so uh, prices have jumped once again. Other good news for the way we're positioned, a global lockdown certainly would, would kill inflation, at least temporarily. But it's politically unviable now. With protests going rampant through Europe, Germany bailed on its lockdown, as the US now has as well. And if you're paying close attention, the official narrative is shifting rapidly. Bill Gates publicly came out and down talked the medicine that he's been telling us we must force the entire world to take, saying that it doesn't work very well and is now shifting to climate change. He is bored with, uh, with the medical experiment on the world. And I think it's really because they're, real, they're seeing their polls are falling off a cliff and they're going to lose their power in politics. So they are quickly abandoning ship. Uh, one of the newspapers to read to get a feel for what their, their stance is, uh, is Drudge Report. This site was taken over post 2022 election and was super anti-populist uh, for most of the year. And now suddenly they're back to being 
uh, very uh, anti-authoritarian, even though we know that they were taken over. So they're definitely uh, pulling back on all these mandates. That means we're set to jet with our current positioning. I believe 2022 will be met with surging energy prices and life-threatening food inflation globally. So we must position for these plays. Now, if the Fed attempts to raise interest rates next summer, which is what the bond market is now pricing in, you're going to create an economic crisis. And we would love that from an investor standpoint, because uh, we can make much more money in a crash than in a slow melt up. So at some point, they will have to fight off inflation. The bond market's telling us it will occur this summer. I think it may not happen until after the midterms. And that's what a lot of the big banks are predicting as well. So what does this mean? It means stocks, crypto, and commodities will likely melt up. I'm thinking now at least until June when they pass this stimulus. Now the risk is if the Build Back Better agenda is blocked, the market may crash for one to two months max, and then they will push this through. One way or another, this budget will be approved and create this inflationary impulse we're anticipating. Okay, so failure to pass this budget probably will create the crisis before the deadline. Janet just gave them an extra two weeks. December 15th is when the next debt ceiling crisis will occur. So if you remember that pullback in September, it was due to fears that the debt ceiling uh, would be hit and the government would have to shut down. The US government is the biggest company in the world and it completely controls the inflationary and deflationary effects of global economies. So that's why we spend so much time focusing on these guys. Uh, I would estimate at this point that if we don't see progress, mainly from Manchin, uh, by December 7th, that we're gonna get volatility. Failure to close a deal in November is likely to cause a stock crash in December. And that's why we like UVXY, the VIX, because it protects us with 1,000% plus gains. Last March, had you been long UVXY, it skyrocketed up 1,100% in less than four weeks. So a 10% position can completely protect a portfolio if you get a 30% pullback in a month, which was historic. But get this, the market could now fall 40% and still be above February 2020 levels. So if we went back towards March levels, we're looking at a 60 to 70% correction. 2000% return on UVXY is now very, very possible, perhaps three to 4,000, depending on how bad this gets, if we get the right black swan event. Now, again, I don't think we're gonna get that right now, and that's why we're not betting big on that position. Now may be the best time ever to follow our high risk, high return strategy. And I would couple it with the pro strategy. Okay, so the pro is gonna give you a global portfolio, a lot of value, cheap equities, highly diversified. And then you add on top of that, you layer it with our super aggressive bet on inflation with high risk. You can do really well over a longer period of time. So that's the, the long and skinny of it, my core prediction remains that we will have a slow, mo slow motion multi-year rotation out of growth and into value. And so it's happening right now, folks. Just look, NASDAQ is down 1.4%. Uh, That's growth. So tech stocks, long duration, that'd be the QQQ, the TLT, companies like Tesla, companies like ARK Funds. Okay, and then our inflationary hedge is NRG, that's the oil and gas company. So there we go, that is happening as we speak. XLE is the energy ETF. And what we're looking at in this chart is how long these inflationary uh, cycles last. And it's about five years. So in the dot-com bubble, they tried to reduce deficit spending in 2001. You got a two year stock crash. They then went to double deficit spending, suppress interest rates on bonds, and you got XLE taking off all the way until the housing crisis developed. We get a one year crash this time and Congress 
reacts much quicker. They double the deficit spending, do quantitative easing, and you get another five-year cycle. Okay, then uh, you put a populist in here who's against big corporations outsourcing labor, and you get this collapse in energy prices. Uh, you get a rising labor force participation rate, and then we lead into the next crisis, the global lockdown. So we're at the very, very footsteps of the beginning of this energy cycle. Okay, and their goals are clear. They want energy expensive and massive investments into climate change. Okay, so that's the perfect setup for, for our NRGU position. Now, when stimulus passes, I expect for pro, the foreign stock markets to greatly outperform the US markets. Okay, and so what we wanna look at is U pro should underperform EDC and EFO. EDC is emerging markets times three. EFO is the European markets times two. So the underlying for EDC is EEM, the underlying for EFO is EFA, and the underlying for UPRO is the SPY. And here it is last time we passed these budgets. Uh, November, Trump came in with a trillion. January, Biden with two trillion. Emerging markets outperform US markets by 50%. Europeans by 35%, expecting the exact same uh, reaction coming around uh, this new budget coming through. Uh, also, we need to anticipate that China is about to go into an aggressive credit easing cycle as the US is now beginning its tightening cycle. And they like to take turns doing that. That's why I never recommend looking at past performance to predict which portfolio will do the best in the future. Uh, so I would be investing heavily in pro and then the high risk as the best combo where you get the most diversified value assets and then merge it into the more aggressive uh, inflation bets. Also expect interest rates to rise and to create a general growth to value rotation. So here's the chart that shows that the yellow line in March shows interest rates going straight up. And for a little while, when we first passed those budgets, energy and tech or growth and value went up alongside interest rates. But when the rate of change of interest rates was too great and the interest you could earn on treasuries became too attractive, what'd you get? You get a crash in your Bitcoin, you get a crash in your tech stocks. And the only thing that saved your butt was the financials and the energy companies. And so we like the energy companies when we look at the politics uh, that are being pushed globally. There's just a huge energy crisis uh, that will not be resolved anytime soon. So that is how we have our clients position. Now, if you're on a free trial and you wanna gain access to that pro portfolio or the safe alpha, give John a call to upgrade or at least to get a walkthrough of our portfolios at 505-610-1334. Okay, very good. I'm gonna jump into our content now, and then we'll cover the details of our other three strategies. Okay, uh, Jeff's saying UVXY didn't make money in February. Yeah, it's only when the S&P 500 goes down that UVXY goes up, so fair point. Uh, it's not gonna make money unless the stock market crashes. Um, and it's also not gonna make money in a growth to value rotation. NRGU makes money if we get a growth to value rotation. UVXY makes money if the stock market crashes. So those are your two hedges uh, that all investors should have for any strategy, uh, no matter what, when we're looking at what's coming down the pipeline. Okay, so here is the yield curve, just so we can get a feel for what occurred. In the green line, uh, we're looking at March when we saw tech stocks tank due to interest rates rising, as you can see. And the blue line is today's interest rates. And the black line is when we started passing these budgets in November. So right before we passed those budgets. So let's see what happened when Trump and Biden threw $3 trillion of spending into the economy. So, okay, well, in November, we had low interest rates, anticipating low growth and low inflation. They passed big spending and guess what the bond market price is in? Higher levels of inflation, 
higher levels of growth and higher interest rates. Not that shocking now, is it? And so we can see these, all of these interest rates at each duration jump significantly. Now, back in March, the interest rate that snapped tech stocks, cracked their back right in half, was 2.4 on that 30 year. So if you're new to the yield curve on the x-axis going left to right, uh, we have one month, three months, one year. This is how long you're gonna lend money to the government. And then up on the y-axis, we have the interest rate you're gonna collect. And the higher the interest rate goes, uh, the more attractive it becomes to investors and it becomes a massive, massive problem for competing assets the higher these go. Uh, Bob says, which ETF could match NRGU in financials? Uh, FAS. Uh, but yeah, I think you get much better return in NRGU, so I wouldn't bother with that. Okay, so uh, let's look at today's yield curve. So what we're really seeing is uh, in today, the big difference is the two-year, which is the most predictive rate for where the federal funds rate should be is screaming out loud, the Fed needs to hike rates. The inflation is ridiculous. Okay, so that's the big change that's developed in a year is that the inflation's not transitory. That was complete BS. And this is here to stay. We need to fight inflation by raising the federal funds rate. That's the cost to borrow from the very top. And this will affect all interest rates down the food chain. But what is the bond market telling us about the effects of hiking these interest rates? Is it telling us it's going to work or is it telling us it's going to be a disaster? Well, on the long end, the 20 and 30 year interest rates are falling and are actually inverted. So it's telling us a problem. If we don't hike rates, the inflation is going to spiral out of control. But if you hike the rates, you're going to crash the economy. So uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So that's why we got to look at politics, who really runs this world, and what are they going to do uh, to fight inflation while trying to fix the underlying economy and labor markets. So bottom line is I don't think they will hike anything until labor markets are recovered, and they're going to have to start averaging 700,000 jobs a month all the way through summer uh, to be able to, to pull this off. So we'll cover that. Uh, but in general, the worse the economy, the better our portfolios are going to do. And so, uh, so very good. That's our analysis of the yield curve. Now, in this, we're looking at the probabilities of rate hikes. And so right now, the market's predicting a 50% chance they will raise interest rates. Uh, one little micro step to the 25 to 50 uh, basis point range currently at zero, so just knock it up one notch, uh, and that this is likely to happen by June. If we go to July, uh, we can see uh, that it's actually a little lower there. So the, the probability is that it will happen at the tapering uh, completion in June. Uh, so this has just been going up every day. Uh, in fact, now the market is starting to price in, in Jim Bianco has been good at pointing this out, if you want to, to follow someone specifically. Uh, they're now predicting that it's likely they have to raise interest rates before they finish tapering. Uh, that would be a disaster. I don't think that it's going to occur. Um, in fact, now it's actually pr uh, predicting uh, the, the highest likelihood uh, by, by June. Okay, next chart we're going to look at is the VIX term structure. So these are the future contracts for the VIX, and they expire each month. We're mostly interested where the dots jump the most. Uh, so the biggest increase is between currently December and January. Uh, after that, the risk really slows down. And so what's the big risk? the debt ceiling. Everything revolves around this reconciliation bill getting passed to, uh, to raise the debt limit. And that's what makes the global economy run is increasing the debt. Uh, if there's a contraction, it will create a deflationary shock through the financial system. 
Uh, so do we think they're really going to fail to pass a budget when they control all three branches of government and their political polls are falling? I don't think so. So I, I do think they will pass this budget. Um, I believe there'll be about 300 billion shaven off of it so that it doesn't increase the deficit. And I believe they're gonna give Joe Manchin some, uh, some coal deals that benefit his state and this gets shoved through. Uh, so that's what I'm anticipating and why we've remained uh, with no changes. Next thing we're gonna take a quick look at is the reverse repo operations. This is telling us there is demand for US debt. When there's reverse repo, uh, and currently it's at $1.5 trillion, just remarkable. Banks globally are begging the Federal Reserve to borrow their short duration debt instruments so that they can afford to pay interest on deposits globally. Uh, there's really no debt instruments that are attractive uh, to service these debts except the US. And so this tells us there's not enough US debt instruments available in the open markets to curb the appetite of banks who simply want to pay interest on deposits. This is a very bullish sign for our growth assets, especially our tech positions. And this is actually the key signal I'm looking for uh, to alert taking profits on our NASDAQ position and then reallocating that capital into uh, financials or energy. Okay, so uh, still long that NASDAQ and that continues to go higher and higher because of that. All right, so here's uh, really the whole economy in one chart. So we have uh, in one line, gray interest rates. In green, we have the energy companies, call that value. And then in the candlestick, we have growth, the NASDAQ. And so look, if the rates go down, your NASDAQ goes up. If the rates go up, your NASDAQ goes down and your energy goes up. Okay, sometimes we get lucky and they all go up together, uh, but that typically doesn't last for very long. So what do we think is about to happen? Big spending, jobs come back online, the last lockdown risk by January, I believe interest rates are going up. NASDAQ's going to go flat or down and energy is gonna go skyrocketing up. And so as soon as we get a little closer to this moment in time, we can get a little more aggressive with that positioning. Uh, but in general, again, we always wanna have the growth and the value. So we get a nice smooth return with low volatility. Okay, in this chart, we're looking at the Russell 2000 against the S&P 500. Uh, they are trading in lockstep. If I zoom out a bit, we can see that um, IWM, the Russell 2000, broke out of its channel in November. It's pulled back a good bit, uh, but it has given us this bullish signal. So go past that budget, increase the debt ceiling, and I believe IWM will continue to lead the markets higher. This is Stanley Drunken Miller's famous uh, indicator for predicting stocks is looking at the Russell 2000. Okay, next chart is emerging markets. Okay, my big bet is the dollar is going to fall and emerging markets are going to scream higher. Okay, I think that's going to be a big trend for the next decade, um, especially for the next six to 12 months. So very bullish on emerging markets currently. Um, we could spend a lot of time discussing why it's had a rough year. Uh, but essentially, that set of reasons is coming to an end. I'm expecting China's about to reverse its uh, stance of being very stubborn with credit creation. Uh, and that's going to rescue its real estate sector and its overall economy. And as the U.S. starts to tighten its financial policies, China is going to have no choice but to loosen. Um, and so look for emerging markets to dominate. You have a huge position in this, in our pro strategy. Um, so very good there. Next chart is Europe. Okay, Europe's been doing really well. Uh, you can see it hasn't had this pullback like emerging markets has. It hasn't shot up to new highs like US. Uh, but again, as, as the dollar falls, we're gonna anticipate and interest rates rise. EFO is loaded up with banks and does extremely well in a weak dollar situation with rising rates as well. Again, this is a play for pro. 
All right, this chart, we're looking at Bitcoin and Ethereum. They are trading pretty close. Uh, if we zoom out a bit, we can see Ethereum has spanked Bitcoin. I like both. Um, certainly, there's some interesting opportunities for Ethereum that don't qualify for Bitcoin. Uh, but Ethereum has some serious threats that does everything Ethereum does, but better and faster. So it's so very interesting. I'll, I'll reveal who their threats are in a uh, coming screen here. Uh, but in general, I think it's smart to own both, but I do think you can make more money with Ethereum. So that's why our high risk strategy is so focused on Ethereum. Uh, could it hit 8,000 to 20,000 by this summer? I think so. So we're, we're sitting back and letting that one ride. All right, what about gold and silver? Boy, big dump on gold and silver today. You can see that sell off from the 21st to the 23rd, uh, it has fallen almost 15%. Now these are leveraged products in silver and gold. It did have a nice rebound here, uh, but it does look like speculators that can really tip the uh, returns in this asset are so focused on crypto that gold and silver are underperforming. So we're keeping a close eye on that to see if this changes. Uh, so far, it's it's been pretty much a dud. Now, last year, we did get very bullish in gold and silver and lucked out getting out near the top with most of our position. And we've just been sitting on a tiny, tiny position on it ever since. What we really want for gold and silver to do well uh, would be stagflation. We'd want to see the economy uh, really failing to add jobs. And so I think it's too early to, to really see if we're going to be able to recover labor or not. Um, so this may be more of a late 2022 play. Now, if we do think that the politicians are going to screw up here, that Jayapal and Manchin will not come to terms, then we're going to have a debt ceiling crisis. That makes the value of the dollar, U.S. Treasuries, and S&P 500 put, op put options extremely attractive. And so the tickers we like for that are EUO, that's a bet on the dollar against the euro. We like TMF, that's betting on US Treasury yields falling on the long end, okay, with leverage. And then we like UVXY, which gives us one and a half times the VIX playing those front months, which is a very advanced strategy that UVXY does automatically for you. Again, we, do, we own zero EUO, we own zero TMF, and we have a tiny sliver of UVXY because uh, we know that we're on the verge of passing stimulus that's going to take the inflationary assets up, not the deflationary assets. So again, these are called deflationary assets. We're not betting on deflation currently. We've been betting aggressively on inflation. And it looks like it's going to be very, very hard to, to cure the inflation problems without crashing labor markets. So we're betting that the government would rather recover labor then fight inflation because they can't do both simultaneously. All right, now in our bootcamp core strategy, we're combining the global Ray Dalio strategy, the US Warren Buffett strategy called Safe Alpha, plus the high risk, which likes to dabble in uh, some premier markets, crypto, and we're combining it into one strategy. So here's the charts involved in that portfolio or potential charts we're looking at. So FNGU is like the NASDAQ, but it has two Chinese giants and it's only the big, big players. It is dominating up 360% uh, since last July. RAMX is the rare earth metal play. Uh, we like this almost no matter what for the coming several decades. Uh, they just need to aggressively, and we're talking 20 times more, more production. So they're really far behind on that. Uh, to be able to keep up with just electric vehicles alone. Uh, and then you look at the cobalt, that's what Apple is using a lot of. Uh, in general, we really like REMX long-term. TAN, our solar panels, uh, did really well leading into March. Interest rates crashed it really hard all summer, uh, and it's getting ready for its next parabolic move higher. So solar has been the main driver of clean energy uh, and I believe we'll continue to do so. So we're really bullish on that. Uh, uranium 
You're getting ready to do a trade alert for uranium URA. Only way you really resolve the CO2 levels falling um, is nuclear power. Okay, so we can go make a bunch of electric vehicles, but if you have to power them with coal plants, you know, what's the point? So we do need nuclear power, and that's a big agenda. If you listen to John Kerry's climate uh, talks or Bill Gates, they're all about getting that nuclear going. Uh, KRBN, our carbon tax credits, interesting investment. If we think the globalists will control the politics, I do like that ticker, KRBN. Uh, but it's looking like we may have a populist sweep in 2022. So I'm just putting on the watchboard for now um, before we, we really get aggressive with that. I'd probably want to see uh, political favor going back towards the globalists, which right now it's not. Copper is also going to be in short supply uh, indefinitely. We like that position. COPX not in the portfolios currently. Um, and then the other play is the medical marijuana uh, which could potentially become legalized. And I think the Build Back Better bill is going to help push this one up. MJ uh, has been a dud for us this year, but we have a, a smaller position that we've been patient with. So we'll see how that plays out over the next three months. All right, so this is comparing currencies against the dollar. We want to know why is the dollar going up? Okay, so the dollar going up in itself is not going to cause the crash. Okay, so the dollar going up doesn't make it more attractive. Uh, interest rates rising make bonds more attractive. Okay, so that is a, a catalyst for a crash. If we can see interest rates are going up, we know it's gonna suck money from competing assets like a black hole. Uh, but the dollar going up is the opposite. That's telling us there's a tremendous shortage of dollars globally and that somebody's driving the price of the dollar up because they don't like their currency. So we want to know who's causing that. Is it China? Okay. No, it's Turkey. Okay. And you can see that almost every currency that is important is uh, on par with the dollar or outperforming it. It's really Turkey is collapsing and causing this, this dollar spike. And that's why we see oil and the dollar going up. And we're not making much of that as a concern currently. Okay, China is obviously the most important uh, secondary factor in the global economy. And if we were seeing their currency devalue, which would mean this is going up, that would be alarming. It's just not happening. All that's happened to the Chinese economy is it's grown significantly stronger. All right, here's NRGU, just to give you a feel for its volatility. It is a wild one, and we're going to be holding this until uh, a few ways to call a top. So let's go back to the dollar index. I'm going to hide these other pairs. So I will become bearish on our oil position soon as the dollar retests these lows. Okay, so last time we passed budget uh, was well, all through the, the crisis, we we're just spending money like crazy. Uh, the recent lows we've tested are in the 89 to 90 range. And that's exactly where I'm gonna start to pull profits from NRGU is when the dollar falls to those levels or oil goes to absurd levels like 120 to 150. Uh, so we're nowhere near that moment in time. Uh, all the dollars not done has gone straight up. So imagine what's going to happen to your commodities, to your oil, to your rare earth metals, and to your cryptocurrencies when the dollar falls. Okay, the returns we saw in October are going to be peanuts when this occurs. And if the dollar keeps rising, all hell is going to break loose in the stock market. Okay, so it's just, it's not going to be allowed to occur. Uh, and I do believe we are very soon uh, hitting the peak and it's going to fall back down. Now, again, this is a leveraged product. So if you try to use technical analysis on a product that's using three times leverage and you ignore fundamentals, you're going to get fooled and miss out on the big gains ahead. So what I would recommend, if you do want to look at charts, 
uh, just for any reason, and you want to use Fibonacci levels or whatever it is you like to, to use, I call it, you know, magical lines in the sand. Uh, look at the underlying ExxonMobil. Look at its recent highs. Okay, it's highly likely this is going to break into new highs, and the company is going to generate profits greater than it ever has in its history. And that's because of $12 trillion added to the financial system that's now competing over a limited supply of, of oil. And the politicians have made it impossible for anyone to compete with Exxon. They, they have exclusive rights to sell oil in the U.S., and no one else can get a piece of the pie. Okay, so we have the biggest, baddest U.S. companies that are in on this global climate change, and you need to sit back wait for the dollar to fall and for Exxon to hit new highs. And that's when we're gonna start aggressively scaling back profits. So how high could NRGU go? Way higher. We could be looking at 600 to $900 price. Now I'm sure they'll do some splits to keep it lower, uh, but realistically, you know, stick with me. I'm gonna be keeping you in that position and ignoring volatility until we hit these peak prices. All right, next chart, we're looking at uh, some risks to Ethereum. We need to be honest with ourselves about what Ethereum really has and what it could have. Okay, so Bitcoin, a lot of uh, people like to listen to Michael Saylor. He says it's real estate, limited real estate. It's deflationary. It has the highest probability of success, largest market cap, most institutional use, uh, safest network, proof of work, proven on and on and on. Um, and so I like Bitcoin. It's great. It could continue to dominate. Uh, some of the infrastructure legislation is problematic for Ethereum and proof of stake and DeFi. Okay, so we do have the house pushing new bills through that might uh, fix that. Uh, but we need to recognize that you should hedge your Ethereum with Bitcoin. But is Ethereum all that it's made made out to be. Well, what if I told you right now, if I wanted to change Ethereum from one wallet to another, it's going to cost me 40 to $80. And if I wanted to create a smart contract and provide liquidity, I could be charged two to $300. Okay, is that really the new financial system that's going to replace our banking system? No, it's too slow and too cumbersome. And that's why some competitors have begun to shine. Those competitors are Solana, which is being pushed aggressively by venture capital, Anderson Horowitz, who are billionaires. They have put us behind, uh, that, or they're the early seed investors in every tech giant that you know. Okay, They have had their hands on everything. They're in like Flint with the politics. They're in like Flint with the banks, and they are pumping Solana rocket high. It's a serious threat to Ethereum. Uh, I do have a private equity deal where you can get that exposure, where I do this hard work for you. You cannot get access to Solana in the stock market, and you do need some pretty advanced security strategies to hold that. Um, so I'm definitely monitoring the situation. Its market cap is one-tenth that of Ethereum currently. So uh, interesting. At this point, we do know Ethereum is supposed to switch to proof of stake potentially by this spring. And that could be very good news for Ethereum and our core position in high risk. So I'm following that like a hawk uh, and we'll see what impact that has on its competitors. The other big threat is Cardano. Now Cardano is kind of uh, more like Bitcoin than Ethereum in that it has a limited supply. However, it's using proof of stake. It's getting ready to launch its first uh, DeFi exchange called Sunday Swap. And it's a a very well ran operation. The CEO helped found Ethereum itself. The other threat, who is the main programmer of Ethereum, launched Polkadot. And boy, oh boy, is that one proof of stake on steroids. It's highly efficient. Um, so those are the main threats to Ethereum. And if there's a significant problem, don't worry, I will take our profits on Ethereum and, and get us out of the way. At this point, nothing to be concerned about. I'm anticipating Ethereum is going to hit 8,000 to 20,000 in 2022, and we're betting big on it. Um, carefully monitor the legislative risks, and at this point, uh, all 
all signs look good and we remain heavily invested in that position. Uh, Morris says, can I do a brief on Rebel? Yeah, so Rebel's gonna have 20% in the hedging, NRGU or UVXY. It's gonna put 20% in Bitcoin, 20% in Ethereum. It's gonna put 20% in the competitors and it's gonna put 20% into creating income for retirement with proof of stake, uh, staking rewards or with yield farming. And so my favorite yield farm currently is a obscure yield farm called PancakeSwap. Um, it's actually the fastest growing DeFi uh, next to Uniswap. So Uniswap is the DeFi for Ethereum. If you wanna go provide liquidity and create income, you have to be a huge player with tens of millions of dollars for the fees to make sense, okay? Uh, but if we go to PancakeSwap, which is operating off of Binance Smart Chain, um, it allows you to have insane income. Okay, we're talking about yields above 100% per year to provide liquidity, and it's called Pancake Swap. So that's my favorite spot uh, with the assets Rebel Dividends has, and, and, and recognizing that it's 100 times more efficient. So I can do a trade on Pancake Swap for pennies, I can create a smart contract for dollars. Over at Ethereum, it's costing $30 to $40 to, uh, to move the blockchain from one wallet to another, and it's costing hundreds of dollars to create a smart contract. So just yeah. tremendous, tremendous opportunity at PancakeSwap uh, with the size that Rebel Dividends currently is right now. So again, reach out to Victor, guys, if you want to schedule a call. I know Morris wants to put a lot of money into Rebel, so we're looking forward to getting you in there, uh, Morris. Okay, guys, so that's our read on the crypto. Are there some other interesting projects? Sure. Uh, my messaging to, to investors is this. Yes, there's a few other projects that are interesting. Not a big fan of Ripple. I don't like that the owners control the entire supply. Um, I've personally made a lot of money with Ripple. I, I don't like the technology. I don't like the way the assets are spread out. Okay, Binance is one of the pioneers of this space. Rather than own the Binance coin, I prefer to uh, provide liquidity at PancakeSwap. And we're primarily providing liquidity between the Binance coin and all these hot new coins coming out uh, or by staking Cake itself. So that's our exposure to that. Um, next, Dogecoin, but don't take that too serious. I think you might make some money if Elon pumps it with his Tesla sale, uh, but I would not be a long-term holder of Dogecoin. You want to throw some money at it, sell it if it breaks its recent high of 70 cents. My best uh, advice on that. Uh, same thing with Shibcoin. I, I wouldn't be messing with that one. Uh, Avalanche is an interesting project. Don't have a whole lot of commentary on that currently. The Crow coin, I believe, uh, is going to have some significant problems in the next bear cycle. They are essentially bribing people to buy and hold the coin for a year to get a credit card with reward points. And so, uh, you know, they've got just hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising going to pump that coin up. Uh, probably after a big, big crash, I wouldn't mind putting some money behind that. Not now, it's up 100% in the last week, it's ludicrous. Okay, Terra Luna is a very interesting project that I'm investigating more. Um, could be a significant player. Litecoin, I believe, is, is not that exciting. Uh, it's just basically a light version of Bitcoin. Uniswap is the success story of Ethereum, and it's really the only significant success story outside of the NFT marketplace. Okay, so PancakeSwap is Binance's version of Uniswap. Uh, we're looking at the DeFi's being developed for Cardano right now. I'd like to participate in that. One of them is called Sunday Swap. Now, if you're a lifetime member, you get my special report where I give you all the big uh, DeFi projects coming out. Uh, Rose says, how about Polygon? I do like Polygon. We have a position in Polygon in Rebel. Uh, Michael says, what's the minimum investment for Rebel? It's, it's 50K. I only charge 2% a year. So you get a lot of work, a lot of hard work for me. 
uh, for 2% a year. And with a 1% dividend, you make my fee back in the first two months. Now we're starting the dividend in January for anyone who comes in before December. So that has just been adding into the share price currently. Okay, so that is my read on the on the crypto space. I know a lot of people like that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a really interesting long-term uh, project. Uh, when are we gonna hit peak crypto prices? Probably not for three decades. Look at how long it took Amazon and Facebook to hit uh, somewhat of a market saturation. And they're not done growing. They continue to grow at these insane speeds three decades later. So Bitcoin's 11 years old, Ethereum's what, six? The other projects are less than two. So you're getting in at the ground floor in these opportunities. Is there gonna be volatility? You betcha there will be. Is there gonna be governments getting pissed off and banks getting pissed off? You better believe it. Okay, but I do believe this is an unstoppable force and with the right risk management, uh, most likely the best investment opportunity for the coming decade. Uh, Rose says, what is Rebel? I have a private equity dealing, Rose, um, called Rebel Dividends, and you can buy equity in it, essentially. So reach out to Victor if you'd like to schedule a free call uh, where you get to talk to me about that. And I can tell you, the banks do not like this threat. Uh, they have been cutting my bank accounts down as fast as I can set them up. And we're probably going to have to uh, focus on mainly taking in Bitcoin uh, until we get a, a really good banking relationship. So that's been the hardest part of the growth of that company. Uh, but its performance has been, been great. All right, let's move on. So what are we worried about? The lockdown looks like this is politically uh, unacceptable. We've got Bill Gates throwing in the towel. You know, he was uh, earlier in the year saying, until we force the whole world to take this, we're never going to get out of it. Now he's downplaying it. Uh, we can see the narrative is changing. Politics, politics, culture, society uh, are rejecting these, these policies. Um, but look, here's Vermont, the most medicine state in the U.S., and it's, uh, it's hitting record cases right now. So it just goes to show you. Uh, that this is not stopping the spread. Germany, okay, this was very critical and probably the main reason why oil markets rebounded. Germany is not going to lock down. Uh, very high mask and medicine compliance didn't work. Okay, record cases, this is what we're predicting. It's playing out, US is having the same experience. It's gonna rage all the way till January. Uh, they're not gonna lock down the politics and society are rejecting this. So I think it's highly, highly unlikely that we're going to see lockdowns, which was our primary concern for our energy position. This chart's looking at the rate of change of the sickness that's been plaguing the, uh, the globe here. And we predicted it would fall and then rise back up all the way till uh, early January. And here you go, it is happening. And uh, it's just going to keep going all the way into January, our concern would be lockdowns. I don't think they're going to lock down. All right. Uh, this is just the trend of when hospitals fill up, and it's really uh, December to the first week of January. So that's exactly what I'm anticipating. Uh, this should be a relatively hard time for NRGU to do well, but you can see the energy crisis they've created is out of control. So I actually think we may see a melt up into uh, the week month for oil, which is December, um, and that it may override the, uh, the force of, lock of, of the sickness rising. So looking good on that front. All right, here's your key ticker to watch if you wanna follow NRG with any kind of Fibonacci levels or anything of that nature, or look at uh, valuations, I would focus on Exxon. Price of oil is likely to go above 100, and they're likely going to have higher profits than they've ever had in their history. So just hang on to your horses, sit back. And um, <laughs> Oscar said he's had two patients in his 400 bed facility. Wow, Florida's doing good. Well, that's because they've let it come in and do its damage. All right, in this chart, we're comparing interest rates to oil. Uh, I've been telling you, it's something's going to give either oil goes up and rates go up 
uh, or oil goes down uh, and the rates probably just stay where they're at. Um, now we know the central bank is trying to suppress interest rates. And we know banks globally are, have this artificial problem of too much money in the banking system due to printing money and handing it out to everyone. So is that gonna last forever? Or are people gonna spend their money and we're gonna have inflation? Okay, so clearly I believe we're gonna have inflation that people will spend their money uh, and that these interest rates will rise. And so a uh, huge opportunity and we're seeing that start to play off right now. Now we know also governments don't wanna report inflation because that means they shouldn't be spending so much money, which is what their favorite thing to do is. So they're trying to do every hat, every trick in the hat to keep those prices on energy down. Everything's short sight. Only way to fix the energy problem would be to invest in creating more energy. But all the policies happening in the US are stopping that. Okay, they've done everything possible to ensure this energy in crisis unfolds. And we're positioned for this uh, to be a, a Hail Mary touchdown pass for our portfolios. Okay, smother key futures products to focus on <clears throat> outside of oil, the next largest market to, to have interest in is copper. Uh, so if we saw copper crashing, I might think something was wrong. It's holding its ground and at record levels. So no reason to believe weakness in the copper sector. Uh, natural gas just went parabolic here, just outrageous. Uh, so we saw lumber do this outrageous move, come back down, moving back up. We saw natural gas make this outrageous move, come back down, coming back up. So the prediction remains intact. Another metric for inflation uh, is the Baltic dry index, measuring the cost to move commodities around. Continents uh, had this outrageous move, crashed, stabilizing. It's now going to recover at prices we've never seen before in history and never look back. Okay, here are the bond interest rates we're, we're following. Uh, again, what, what are we seeing? The two year is saying the Fed needs to hike rates now. It is pissed off and it's going straight up. Long rates are not doing that. Long rates are saying, well, if you do what the, what the two year says, you're gonna crash the economy. Uh, so it's comical. Um, so what do we pay attention to then? likely labor markets. The magic number, based on all the analysis I have, is you need to get 700,000 jobs consistently for the next six months, and then we're going to see rate hikes. Uh, and then we may actually pay out, be able to successfully do one rate hike without crashing the economy if you get that massive recovery in labor. Okay, but if, if they don't, they're just not going to hike the rates. So you get this flattening yield curve, uh, which creates its own set of problems. For now, all you need to know is don't do a thing. Sit back. We are positioned for this. How crazy can the copper price go relative to gold? And does this predict interest rates? Sure as hell does. And it did a great job protecting your portfolio against interest rates rising from 2002 to 2007, where interest rates went parabolic and created a housing crisis. I believe we're going to see a very similar chart uh, comparing copper to gold if we recover labor. That's why we got to watch the jobs like a hawk. Okay, so we're at the very beginning of this potential move. That's why I'm not betting big on gold and silver right now. I have hope that we can get some jobs back online. If we're not seeing the jobs come back online, you're going to go from reflation to stagflation, and we would have to dramatically change our, our strategy. Uh, but it's just too early for the market to predict a uh, complete failure in economic recovery right now, especially when we're about to pass uh, the Build Back Better stimulus plan. And now they're talking about another plan coming in after that. Okay, if any one of these bond markets is tanking, that's a problem. JNK is your junk bond market. TLT is your treasury market. LQD is your investment grade market. There's no crash, it's trading flat. Everybody has access to, to borrow money at really, really cheap levels. This is all bullish for inflationary assets, stocks, commodities, cryptos. 
Okay, in this we watch Janet Yellen dump bonds into the market with the reverse repo at $1.5 trillion. Uh, bring it on. We would love to see this just fill up. Problem is you can't fill it up till they pass reconciliation and make that debt ceiling go higher. And that's what's gonna pressure that dollar down and rates up. Uh, so for now, everybody's on hold till Joe Manchin and, uh, and the squad come to a deal and pass that spending bill, which again, I believe will occur. Okay, non-farm payrolls, they revised two of the months in the summer up dramatically, uh, huge revision. So it's really funny, this government uh, and the people that control it, primarily the tech giants, they don't want labor to go up because that means interest rates are gonna go up. The money printing is gonna slow down and you get this growth to value rotation. Uh, so they're incentivized to keep labor weak because otherwise they're gonna hike interest rates and collapse the economy. Uh, so very, very interesting on that front. We're gonna be paying very close attention to this report every month. Uh, in general, they need to, to get this above 700,000 a month in the last year, we've had three out of 12 months in that level. So not a good batting average. Uh, we could blame it on the sickness. Um, so let's see, let's be open-minded and see how this plays out. OSHA mandates were shot down. Uh, so that's good. That'll help people get back to work and not create all these layoffs and crazy bureaucracies uh, slowing down commerce. Uh, we're seeing all sorts of companies say, we're not going to do this. We're going to lose uh, a quarter of all our employees. Uh, it's just not going to work. So that's good news on the labor front. Okay, core inflation, I believe, will be over four for the entire year. The, what's going to push it up now is going to be energy costs, rising wages, and rising rent, and food inflation. Uh, so that's all coming in. Um, we can look at the prices of ammonium, ammonia to create fertilizer, and it's gone up like tenfold. So all the farming that's happening now uh, or planning to happen uh, is going to cost much more than it did last year. So it's very easy to predict that food prices are going to go much higher next year. Michael says, I haven't heard anyone explaining financial analysis like you. I've wasted years chasing stock after stock. Yeah, though all the super rich do it the way I, I, I didn't invent this, guys. This is how the great investors look at the markets. And so I've just been studying them and can put it into very simple terms for us. All right, so if we're going to slow down quantitative easing and government money printing, what's going to keep the credit fueled into the US economy? Well, it's gotta come from the private sector now. So we wanna see bank credit and US retail credit grow as the fiscal cliff comes in. Okay, so that's gonna happen if jobs are coming online and banks are more willing to lend and consumers are more interested in borrowing. Um, so that's happening. Look at this chart, we can see bank credit is growing. That's what we wanna see for how we're positioned. Okay, what about credit cards? Oh boy, US credit cards are growing at a handsome clip. Lowest print was 13 billion, highest print was 38 billion. So no contraction there. Retail sales hit 1.7. Everybody in the bond bull market uh, thesis thought that this was gonna crash because the government's not handing out money. Uh, not happening. Okay, retail is continuing to grow. Here's another way to look at it. Uh, if we do the 25 year chart, US spending is at record highs. We've never seen this level of spending um, and it's continuing to grow. Harry says, is silver gonna go permanently down? Should we dump it? No, I haven't dumped it, Harry. So hold on to it. If we get bad labor reports, silver's going up. Uh, we have a light position in silver. Okay, job opening starting to fall, showing that we are getting some jobs back. Uh, producer prices, no sign of weakness here. So the input costs for corporations 
remains high, they are passing these costs to the consumer. And so far, the consumer is not minding it. They keep buying. Now think about it. If you think the prices of things are going to keep going up, it gets you in this panic mode to go buy, buy, buy. And it's only until you run out of money or you believe the prices have hit a peak that you would suddenly stop and wait for those to pull back. Most people think about retail, think about the stock market. Most people enjoy buying high and then they love to sell low for a huge loss. Not many people are smart enough to, to do the opposite. Okay, initial job claims. I'd like to see that go sub 200,000 to get really excited uh, about labor growth. Uh, but it's, it's staying at least below 300. Earnings continue to grow at the hourly wage rate. Uh, no signs of this slowing down. Is it keeping up with inflation? Absolutely not, uh, but it is going up. Uh, salaries also growing year over year at a very fast rate. Okay, so uh, had we not gone into a global lockdown, uh, perhaps labor force participation today could be at 62 to 63. Instead, it's at 61.6. Okay, so we lost about 5 million people from the labor force. And it looks like it's primarily people who are deciding, screw it, my stock account's up, I'm retiring. Um, so not only do we want to see the unemployment rate going down, we want to see the labor force participation rate going up. Okay, and if this doesn't go up, uh, it's going to be very hard to recover the economy. Peter says, what does Michael Berry see that is in conflict with the melt-up we're anticipating? The negative podcasts are killing me. Um, oh, Michael? Is he negative? Yeah, well, he was betting Tesla would crash at 400 and went to 1200. <laughs> so, and then he sold at the top um, and deleted his Twitter account. Yeah, I wouldn't listen to Peter. All right, here we have the United States balance of trade going to the lowest level ever. ever. So if you have negative deficits, uh, the twin deficits, what it's called, it's usually going to make the dollar go down over time. That's Jeffrey Gunlack's biggest prediction and how we're uh, positioned. Uh, so there you go, biggest trade deficit in US history. Way to go, USA. Okay, personal income, uh, tiny pullback, nothing to get freaked out there. Some canaries in the coal mine. What are some single tickers we should be watching to predict problems? Apple, record high, no problem there. That's our single largest position in every portfolio because it's the largest position in all these ETFs. Uh, Tesla hanging in there. So no signs of concern there. Um, as far as a resistance level, I am worried about it's way down here at 800. So if we crash below 800, I think that could create some systemic selling in ETFs, one of which would be ARK funds. Uh, this poor lady is probably about to get clobbered. This is ARC funds. She's betting big on interest rates never going up, um, which I think is the exact wrong call for the next five years. There could be interim times where rates go lower. Uh, and I think that'll be around 2023 after the midterms, politically acceptable for the central bank uh, to try to fight inflation after the midterms. Uh, but again, they could fight inflation sooner if you get enough jobs online without creating an economic crisis. So that's why these jobs are going to be so important here. Okay, in China, we're looking at Tencent stabilizing. I believe this is getting ready to take off. Uh, Alibaba had some very bad earnings recently, uh, and it sold back down. China has been doing a lot to clean up their economy, and I think they're getting towards the end of the cleanup and back to the expansionary. Uh, period, which would mean the credit impulse is going to go back positive. So we're not freaking out about China or Alibaba, despite what's been occurring. I understand what China is doing, why they're doing it, and I don't think it's a long-term problem for us. Okay, we got Samsung getting a nice jump up here. No problems with Samsung, and then Toyota just kicking butt at record levels here. So no 
warning signs outside of the Turkish lira devaluing uh, by and far. Okay, China's PMIs had gone negative, popped back up. Uh, they're likely going to start printing money here. Europe's PMIs are still in very positive territory. Uh, China's imports and exports did drop in October, uh, but big picture, should we freak out or are these levels never seen in history? These levels have never been seen before in history. We've had three month pullbacks uh, twice in the last year as their economy continues to grow and their imports hit new highs and their exports hit new highs. So there's no uh, significant sign of a crash in China's economy. Exports have been rising steadily with only uh, a few months where it's even flatlined, two months where it's gone down. So in February, we had a drop. October, we had a drop. Uh, we've had a few months where it had traded flat in general. China's economy is dominating. And that's why you wanna have that emerging market exposure, even though the stocks have gone down this year. Okay, central banks keep on printing new high for the Federal Reserve hitting 8.67 trillion. We've got the European Central Bank hitting a new high, uh, 8.3 trillion. Japan did slow down uh, in his flat line. Now China doesn't do a bond market because they don't have a freely trading currency. So we don't watch that as much. Um, they're mostly all about their imports and exports. Okay, very good. So we're about to hop into uh, analysis of our other three strategies. And if you're watching this replay on YouTube, you didn't get the intro where I did live build outs with our active free trial members. And you're also not gonna get the closing where I revealed the exact formula uh, for our three other strategies. So call John at 505-610. 1334. So you can upgrade your account. And again, my best recommendation is to go big on the pro and then go big on the high risk. Combine those two, sit back and wait for us to, to get through the midterms. I think we'll be probably changing strategy most dramatically in early 2023 and probably seeing some of the best returns we've had in those two portfolios coming right up. Okay, very good. So let's go ahead and hop into. Uh, the next portion of this video.